for today, we have Dr. Josie Blasco. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing the, the, the right. It's okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Josie has master and PhD in computer science from uh, Universidad Politecnica de Valencia. I I thought that it should be the you know, Polytechnic University of Valencia, and he worked for IBM uh, before joining to an. Institute of Valencia de Investigations Agresia. I would assume should be a research institute for agriculture uh, in 1996. And he has developed application for computer vision and precision agriculture. Uh, his area of interest is automating non-destructive quality inspection of the fresh products and crops monitoring using non-destructive optical technology. So then he has done a great job in the matter of the international and national collaboration and establishing different projects uh, with uh, 75 scientific articles and 20 international book chapters and more than 175 conference presentation and invited talks. And we had a short talk and looks like there will be a international event uh, happening in summer in Spain. Uh, and he's organizing that. Probably you, if you have any topic, you may want to go and visit him in person. For today's mm -hmm. purpose, he will talk about use of images for crop management in a precision agriculture strategy. We will recording this event and later on we will, we will upload in uh, YouTube. If anyone has any concern, please just uh, text me or uh, in the text box and email me or Rim or Julian. And we are as an organizer, uh, we would be happy to hear you. Otherwise, just uh, we are recording and we will upload this uh, session on YouTube. Uh, with being that, don't uh, don't make no more delay for, for Dr. Jose. Just uh, please, Dr. Jose, go ahead. And all for you, just... Uh, to the, your sharing slides and talk. Okay. Uh, thank you, Gador. Thank you, Sir Rim. Uh, thank you for this kind invitation and also for the, your kind presentation. I'm going to share my screen now. I hope it works. Um, Okay. Uh, oh, uh, okay. Okay. I think I'm sharing my screen now. Is, is that correct? Yes, we see your screen. Okay, <laughs> good. Well, um, my name is uh, Jose Blasco. I, I'm I'm going to talk about the use of images for crop management in a precision agriculture strategy. Uh, well, uh, I am PhD in computer science, not in agriculture, as, as many people uh, think, because uh, I, I'm working for more than 25 years in an agricultural re uh, institute. I'm currently the coordinator of the Agric Agricultural Engineering Center here at Ivia in Spain. We are in the east of, of Spain facing the Mediterranean Sea. And I'm the current coordinator of the CIGR uh, working group on image analysis for agricultural products and processes. Uh, actually, we are organizing a workshop uh, about this topic, uh, image analysis and spectroscopy in agriculture, next December in, in, in Kyoto, in Japan, along with the CIGR uh, World Congress. Well, Precision agriculture is, is a strategy, it's a management strategy that takes into account uh, of temporal and spatial variability. This is important to highlight the uh, temporal and spatial variability because this is the key word of uh, precision agriculture. And the uh, goal is to improve sustainability and uh, of, of agricultural uh, production. This is a definition of the ISPA in the International Society for Precision Agriculture. So can we trust on our eyes uh, to see the, our environment? Well, I, I don't think so. If you look at these images, uh, you can see in the top uh, left uh, image some circles that maybe uh, you think they are moving or uh, just below in, in the 
bottom left image, you can see some black dots in this image. Or even in the bottom right, uh, maybe uh, you, you don't see that these uh, streets are parallel. However, nothing in this, uh, in this image is moving. Everything is stopped. There are no black dots. All, all, of, all of dots are white and, the, and these uh, lines are parallel. So I don't think we can trust on our, uh, our eyes to uh, make decisions about uh, objects when we in, in, in an inspection process. So we need some uh, accurate uh, systems. Uh, accurate systems to determine objectively uh, the properties of the object that we are inspecting. Okay, but uh, the, when we are talking uh, about artificial machine vision, so artificial uh, vision, we need to take some things uh, into, ac into account. We have to consider that we need a good image acquisition. This is essential. Good image acquisition, otherwise we, we don't get uh, any good result. Because I, I'm talking about a good illumination, a good scene, everything is good. Later you can correct using some software, some filters, images. But if, if you, you don't start from a good image, you don't get good results for sure. Uh, after, after that, you um, have to work in a good feature extraction from the images. You can use some segmentation or some image processing algorithms or some statistical methods, but uh, you have to be sure that your feature section uh, from the images is, is good, is robust. And for that, you need, uh, you need uh, a, a robust uh, that data analysis. This is key from any uh, process of involving uh, artificial vision images in or the processing of the images. So, um, and for and this is key. This is uh, the, the one of the most important things in any um, system of about about uh, inspecting images. Uh, using machine vision is a proper reference data, ground truth. I mean, for any um, any process that you want to automate or you want to inspect, you need a very proper ground truth to compare with, to create good uh, predict, uh, predictive models. However, we have to take into in consideration that uh, the biological uh, objects are not as the industrial objects. I mean, in, we, we can see here some, some manufactured products and if any of them has any small defect, it's easy to see. You can see how in, 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 in the second on the right, there are some, some uh, small defects. Any machine vision system can easily detect this because all of these pieces are, are identical. So it's very easy for comparison to discover and Objects. This this is this not happened. In this image, different orange has different colors, different textures, shapes. Everything is different. So the algorithms to process these images are very complex, are different. So sometimes we have to look for um, properties that are different for uh, the ones that the, our eyes can see. Our eyes can see colors, shapes. However, uh, when we want to see the nature the properties in the nature, we have to look for properties that are invisible to the human eye. In this sense, uh, we have to take into account that the plants are, um, well, uh, are, um, are, are alive. They res uh, respire, they make photosynthesis, they tra make transpiration, they evolve, and uh, they, they have some chemical processes that uh, uh, makes them to absorb or reflect electromagnetic radiation during the photosynthetic uh, activity. Okay, this photosynthetic activity, this radiation may be altered for some stresses produ uh, that produce changes in the plants. When one plant is stressed, uh, the reduction of the transpiration is, re uh, well, happens, a reduction of transpiration. Um, 
happen a reduction of uh, carbon dioxide, ab uh, dioxide absorption and there is a reduction of the photosynthetic activity. This stress affects the temperature of the plant that increase uh, the pigments that are involved in the photosynthetic, uh, photosynthetic activity. The leaf and the plant structure also changes. The water content also changes because uh, the temperature is higher and the plant cannot evaporate uh, the water. And this affects uh, at the end the energy that is reflected or emitted by the plants. So these changes can be measured by spectral and thermal sensors, like this one that I'm showing, I, I'm sorry, uh, I'm showing in this in this slide. These sensors measure the electromagnetic energy at uh, different wavelengths in the visible and the near uh, infrared part of the spectrum. Some of the most common optical sensors to measure these are the color cameras, any camera, any 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 uh, DLS or camera multispectral cameras, hyperspectral cameras, also uh, thermal cameras that can measure the temperature of the objects. And I'm talking, I'm talking about also about the, the LIDAR. LIDAR is a, a laser, scanner laser because this sensor, this, uh, this scanner laser can give us some information about the structure of the objects. In this case, the structure of the plants. And this information can be useful for some applications and uh, as I'm going to show you in the next uh, slides. Okay, the visible uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum, the visible uh, information is between 400 and 700 nanometers, can get, uh, gather data on pigments. Pigments are responsible of, of the color of the, of the fruits, for instance, or the leaves. They are responsible for capturing the energy. They are strongly related with the photosynthetic activity Let's think on the chlorophyll, uh, for instance. Uh, the pigments also absorb uh, the energy at certain no wavelengths, uh, as I'm showing you in this picture. In this picture, we can see how the chlorophyll has a peak of absorption near uh, 430, 460, also another one near uh, 700 nanometers. But uh, we plants also contain other pigments like lutein, uh, carotene, uh, lycopene, uh, and, and tocianin, xanthophyll, etc. These pigments are responsible for colors or uh, or uh, well, um, other processes like uh, uh, photosynthetic activity or the absorption of the of the energy and the conversion of the energy in. Uh, <coughs> Well, sorry. Uh, this is the, the visible part of the spectrum. However, in the near infrared uh, part, it's not visible. It, we can relate uh, this, uh, this near infrared part between about 700 nanometers and let's say 100 uh, nanometers. We can relate this, this uh, part of the spectrum with the, the structure of the cells, the water content of the plants, the evapotranspiration of the plant, and we can link this uh, the part, the, the electromagnetic that we can measure using these sensors with the uh, stress of the plants. This stress can be uh, due to maybe uh, the plant is uh, just uh, is a lack of water, or maybe uh, the, the plant has a disease. So at the moment, if we detect uh, uh, a stress plant, we don't know the reason. We have to look uh, into, into the problem, uh, maybe uh, using uh, or analyzing in deep uh, better the, the information uh, to discover what's happening with this stress plant. But at the moment, we know that something is happening with this plant. Different, actually, different species uh, have different um, vegetative characteristics. For instance, uh, in, the, in, in the graph in the top uh, left, we have the typical spectrum of the um, sun, um, sunlit soil. There's no plants in the soil. Uh, and as, as we have more plants, we have a more uh, leaf index area, the spectrum is higher. We have more reflection of the energy. Also, 
different varieties or species of, veg of, of plants has uh, different uh, electromagnetic responses, electromagnetic spectrums. And uh, as I said, uh, depending on the health of the plant, the spectrum can be different. And we can measure to get the images. If we think on a color camera, color camera uh, can get only three wavelengths, wavelength in red and green and in blue. As is this is the similar or identical process that do our eyes and our brain. Our eyes uh, collect these three wavelengths, red, green, and blue. We have these, uh, the cells to collect these, these wavelengths and our brain mix the information to make the colors. The camera do something similar, takes these three wavelengths and by measure, uh, by mixing the three colors or sorry, the three um, monochromatic images, red, green, and blue, the cameras can uh, get the color. However, standard cameras only can get colors, which, which is the appearance of the, of the objects, in this case of the fruits. To obtain more information are necessary more sophisticated sensors. If we want to see something that is not visible, that is invisible or is hiding or is inside the fruits or, or, in, or the plants or what happened with the plants, we have to get uh, or to, we have to use uh, more sophisticated sensors like for instance, multispectral cameras. A multispectral camera can get a, a limited number of K wavelengths. It's not three. Okay, if one color camera collects only three bands, three wavelengths, a multispectral camera can collect nine, 10, 15 bands, different bands. That allows uh, the use of ve uh, veg uh, vegetative or spectral indices. I, I will talk later about uh, these vegetative spectral index, uh, in indexes because they are key to uh, understand some phenomena that can happen in the plants. Apart that multispectral camera, that's as I said, they work like a color camera, but with more bands. We also have hyperspectral cameras. Hyperspectral cameras are uh, devices uh, that cap capture spectral and spatial information. One spectrometer is a, uh, well, can get uh, the, the spectrum of one point, but one hyperspectral camera can get the spectrum of, uh, of well, of a scene. And every pixel gave, uh, is giving us uh, one spectrum. As uh, here we have in this image, an example of, an, of what could be a hyperspectral e image, which is normally represented as a hypercube is a cube composed by, by, by many uh, monochromatic images, green, red, well, uh, uh, depending on the resolution, maybe every nanometer, every 10 nanometers, we can get one monochromatic image. So from every point in the image, we can get the spectrum. So this is very convenient when we have to um, get information of uh, areas that are not homogeneous. If we're inspected, one fruit, that one, one orange, for instance, is more, more or less homogeneous. We can get one point and get an idea about the, the composition of, the, of, the, of this fruit. But when we are talking to plants, about plants, uh, depending, uh, maybe, for instance, in this image, uh, the, 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 the upper pixel selected here is a, a young leaf the pixel uh, in, in the in, in the bottom is an uh, older leaf. So uh, these are the, these these have different spectrums. So we can distinguish uh, among uh, different structures or in in one tree, young leaves, older leaves, stressed leaf, maybe branches, maybe holes uh, in the in the in the plant, etc. And uh, the typical techniques to, in, to process or to analyze these images are, by, are based on chemometrics like PCL, air, PCA, uh, LDA, linear uh, is, uh, is chemical analysis, but also uh, machine learning techniques like, uh, like uh, artificial neural networks or deep uh, convolutional neural networks that uh, are in fashion now. Deep learning now is in fashion to 
process hyperspectral images. Okay. The spectral index, uh, indices are formulas that use one or more bands. Um, take a look of these images and see how a healthy leaf uh, emits a large amount of near infrared um, information, near infrared signal. However, a dead leaf or a stressed leaf uh, emits uh, a lower amount of near infrared uh, radiation. So we can get these differences to well, detect uh, or discriminate between healthy leaves and stress leaves. How? Well, we can invent uh, a spectral index like this is the most known uh, and the NDVA is normalized uh, difference vegetative index. And this makes the, the difference between the near infrared and the red. Hmm? As the red remains more or less stable and the near infrared reduce from the healthy a healthy plant stress plant or a dead plant this index this formula can give us some information about the status of this plant so a high uh, index means that the plant is healthy but a lower index means that the plant uh, is not healthy actually there are other indexes. Here you can find uh, a database of more than 300 spectral indexes. These are one of the most uh, used in uh, remote sensing in precision agriculture is OSEBI, uh, Chikari, um, the PRI, NDRA, uh, ARI. Well, they are used for different uh, purposes. For instance, uh, Osevi and Chikari are used for nitrogen content to determine nitrogen content. Uh, the RE are for anthocyanin content. The CWSA is for water content. So depending our application, we will use one or another uh, spectral index. And we normally uh, calculate uh, these indexes by do some arithmetics with uh, spectral bands. And this information or these spectral bands can be uh, obtained using this, multi, for instance, multi-spectral or hyperspectral cameras. The maps on the right have been collecting actually using a multi-spectral camera and combining uh, the bands using these uh, indexes, we can have these maps of our crop and then uh, we'll get into the differences uh, of, of, of the crop to get the vari variability of the crop. Okay, let's talk about some application, practical applications on remote and proximal sensing. First is to talk about a, a spatial scale. Well, if you, if we need to cover large areas, uh, I, well, if, if I want to create some policy uh, of, of the land, uh, to make a global strategy of my region, I can use some uh, images from satellite. However, if I need more detail, more resolution, if we want to detect individual plants, maybe I can use uh, an aircraft to, um, to obtain images with higher resolution. With an aircraft, I can cover large areas, but also I can uh, detect uh, details. Maybe I can uh, have resolution of uh, five, 10 meters, even even less. Um, how, if I want to move uh, to leaf to plant resolution, if I want not only to detect plants, but also to uh, get details on, on leaves, I can use a drone, uh, an unmanned um, aerial vehicle like uh, this one. So I can get images from one crop with high precision uh, from plant to leaf. But finally, if I want to get information on the leaves because um, I want to inspect my particular crop and I want to detect pests or um, nutritional um, concentration, or at the end, any application that needs uh, for uh, leaf resolution, I can put my sensors on a robot or I can use some handheld uh, sensors 
so I can uh, collect very, very uh, high resolution images. So depending on my spatial scale, on my needs, I will use one kind of images or another kind of images. I'm going to focus on robotic and robotic systems and drones because, well, I'm quite familiar with them. I have uh, been working with the, these technologies, so I can show you some of uh, applications that uh, have been developed here in, in, in my institute. Well, um, another thing to consider is uh, what is my, my goal? It's not the same uh, uh, cereal crops like the, this one on the left or a fruit crop like uh, the image on the right. So uh, it's different because, uh, well, one intensive crop like uh, uh, cereals is quite homogeneous and uh, I can get one image and apply a uh, The image. However, when I'm talking about fruit crops, we have to separate individual plants, we have to separate plant from soil, from other structures, buildings, etc. So it's, it's more complicated to deal with uh, fruit crops, for instance, that uh, uh, from weed. And take uh, this is this picture is, is quite uh, important, quite illustrative, because they are taken at the same scale. So the, uh, these pictures cover the same area. However, one cereal um, crop is, is very large. So probably I can use one satellite or one aircraft uh, to discover variability on this crop. However, if I'm talking about fruit crops, uh, um, probably a satellite is not enough to detect details and I need one drone or a closer um, sensor because otherwise uh, the, the, the process of this image will be very, very complicated. Okay, uh, as I said, I'm going to talk about robotic platforms. It's proximal sensing. Proximal sensing is when, when the sensors is on the ground and remote sensing uh, is uh, when the sensor is in the air. So what are main differences? The main differences are that, well, uh, robots have a, a long battery life that uh, a drone, for instance, uh, you can use a robot in a crop for hours, maybe one day. However, a drone is, uh, well, uh, is some 15 minutes, 20 minutes. A robot can carry complex sensors, hyperspectral, thermal, multispectral, color, many different sensors, leader. But uh, the payload of, of, a drone, of a drone is very short. They can mount a, one thermal camera, one multispectral camera, that's all. And uh, well, a robot can do some agricultural operations, that do some weeding, for instance. Uh, this is more difficult with a drone. There are some, some oper they can operate, for instance, uh, doing some spraying, but in this sense, they are quite limited. And uh, a robotic platform can be autonomous, that can navigate alone through the, through the crop but uh, well, um, a drone normally needs a, a pilot, uh, is submitted to flight regulations that are not easy, especially if you are near an airport or a military a facility or something like that. So, however, uh, well, um, you can cover very large areas with, uh, with other drone and with a robot, this is limited one to, to only one crop every day or something similar. So depending on your application, it's better to use one or another uh, platform. Well, I'm going to talk about two applications on using ro robotics or at least drone vehicles. First is yield prediction in a vineyard we, because we did this uh, um, here in Spain, in the north of Spain, we have a good wine producers and they very interested in precision viticulture. So they wanted to create an application to predict the yield. So we, we put some sensors on, on a vehicle. Um, we do some trials in the morning with some light and shadows in the afternoon and also in the evening near the sunset with and without some artificial lighting. And also we try at night with no sunlight influence. So everything was under control because we wanted to know if 
it's better. At, at the end, a robot can operate at night or at any hour. So we put some lights on this quad. We put two sensors, is one color camera, one near infrared camera. And we do some, uh, well, some passes in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening, in the night, and also with the near infrared cameras. You remember that at the beginning, I said that uh, it's very, very important to get good images. So if you say, if you can um, see here uh, in the morning, the images are not very good because, okay, the clusters can, can be seen very well, but there are many shadows, many um, bright, bright spots. So, um, well, it's difficult to, to discriminate one cluster in these images. Maybe apparently uh, they are more clear but at the end, uh, in this image, when one cluster has one bright uh, part and one shadowed uh, part, an algorithm to process, to process these images. So the, in, in the afternoon or even at night, we could get better images. At least the, the clusters have an homogeneous illumination and this facilitates uh, a lot of the detection of the of the individual clusters. So at the beginning, we try uh, with um, a supervised segmentation method. We used uh, a method based on um, discriminant analysis. This work by manually selecting different areas of the image. So we se we select some pixels on leaves. We select some pixels on, on, on the clusters, on the branches, on the soil. And with pixels, we create a predictive model based on discriminant analysis. And this model could predict uh, the, the class of the rest of the pixels. So I, once the model was created, uh, we apply this model to a new image and the model could uh, determine uh, the, the, the area at which each pixels belong to. If it was a cluster, leaves, branches or soil. However, this method works work very, very well under a particular lighting conditions because uh, we took images with, uh, well, this system was trained using a set of images get uh, using uh, or, or in a particular lighting conditions. If the lighting conditions changes, uh, the model get conf get some confusion because the color changes. I mean, um, okay. When we train this system, the the colors because of the of the of the sunlight, the colors were um, quite determined uh, for uh, the lighting of the environment. Okay. After a couple of hours, the, the sun was, uh, or, well, I mean, uh, it's complicated. Sorry. Uh, well, the fact is that if we try in this, this system with a particular conditions and these conditions changes because uh, another image is more or less illuminated, the model is not working anymore. So we, we have to retrain hmm, the new image or the new uh, lighting conditions for uh, another model. So at the end, this no, uh, didn't work because of this. We need a lot of uh, retrains. So we try another strategy. This another strategy was based on adaptive segmentation. Uh, there are some methods that it doesn't matter uh, the conditions, it doesn't matter the image, we just put the image, put, them, put the, the, the technique for segmenting the images and these images just look for differences in, 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 the, in, the, in the image. So this method, uh, uh, when applied to this image of clusters, just differentiate between dark parts like, like uh, uh, clusters, green parts like leaves, gray parts like uh, well, soil, and automatically this method separate uh, or split uh, the, the image 
in different classes. At the end, we could identify the clusters and goes to the original image to highlight the clusters. In the, in the, in, in the image in the middle, the clusters are represented in dark blue. So all the pixels in dark blue are selected in the original image, supposing to be the clusters. Okay, then we apply another algorithm uh, to this or, uh, to these parts of the orig original image. In this case, we use the H image of uh, using the H is I model. Finally, we did a cluster detection, and at the end, we could identify uh, by um, a feature extraction algorithm the clusters. So at the end, we could. Uh, well, make not only detect uh, the clusters, but also to have an idea about the area of the clusters, because this we related this area of, of each cluster with the weight of the clusters. So we found that the best predictions were, were found in the afternoon, on the uh, evening. The system didn't work under the sunlight conditions. The, the results were, were not good, but it was very, very funny because uh, we find that uh, we found sorry, uh, processing about 70 kilograms of clusters of grapes, uh, we got one error of about one kilogram. However, we tried with 10 kilograms and we also found about one kilogram of error. And we tried uh, using 200 kilograms and the error was the same, one kilogram. So maybe this is the error of the of the system, one kilogram. It doesn't matter how many grapes we inspected, the error was all, uh, at the end the same. So uh, actually the, the, the accuracy of this system to estimate uh, the yield was very, very, very high, especially in large productions. I'm passing now to another application. It was XF Robin. It's a robotic platform that we developed here at Ivia. Uh, in this case, is uh, a robot that was uh, controlled remotely to detect uh, Silea fastidiosa. Silea fastidiosa is, uh, is a bacteria that has killed more than one million of trees in Italy. Uh, has been absolutely devastating. It's it is similar to the one long being in the US that has killed most of the well, citrus in Brazil and California. So yeah, they, they are emergent pests, very dangerous. And we try to, well, to detect this, inf uh, this bacteria by, by detecting infected trees before the symptoms are visible. So we built uh, a small a low cost uh, man robot. This robot was uh, remotely controlled, was electric, uh, moved with batteries and solar panels. And this robot uh, mounts a lot of different optical sensors, uh, a, a reflex camera, a modified uh, reflex camera, the LSR camera to capture blue NDVI images using these two ones, one, uh, 480 and 850. Uh, we, this robot also has a multispectral camera with nine bands, a thermal camera, a leader to get the 3D structure of the trees, uh, an inertial unit, a global navigation system, an encoder to synchronize the sensor acquisition with the advance of the robot. And in the last uh, version of the robot, now we have also a high spectral camera uh, to get images between 900 and uh, 1700 nanometers. This is actually, uh, the second version of the robot, the pictures that you are, you are going to see now are from the first version. This is an evolution, but as you see here, this is more uh, well, older version of the robot. This uh, robot was, as I said, uh, aimed at uh, detecting olive trees infected by this uh, bacteria, Silea fastidiosa, with an, uh, without visual symptoms. This is important, without visual symptoms. So apparently the trees are healthy, but uh, well, uh, in the end, they are not. We tested uh, in a field with slight symptoms of Silesia in the Southern Italy. And this is very important to get their ground truth, their reference. And we did a visual evaluation of all trees. We annotate 
for each three, five uh, levels of severity of the infection, but also we did molecular analysis of selected trees, this Q, uh, QPCR. Uh, the robot move in the field in two directions, in, in rows and in columns. Uh, so we could get images of the four uh, sides of each uh, tree moving at uh, one meter per second. So images were captured every meter, labeled uh, and, and stored in, 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 the, in the computer of the, of the robot. We also collect leader GPS and IMU uh, information uh, at a rate of uh, 25 uh, per second. We got this kind of images, images of uh, with the color camera, images with the NDVI camera. These are the two big images, but also images with the multispectral camera in different wavelengths uh, to create uh, NDVI, uh, sorry, uh, to create uh, yeah, NDVI images, blue NDVI, and different and, and images using different uh, spectral indexes. So the results. Some of the results uh, are shown here. The, in, the, in the left part, we find the image that we obtained with the visual um, inspection of the trees. In green, it does, it means that the, the tree is healthy. This tree has no problems. In red is that this um, tree has different problems. What it was funny is that uh, visually, they are apparently in good state, they are healthy, but the QPCR analysis revealed that 98% of the trees were infected. So uh, how this could be possible? Okay, we discovered at the end that, uh, well, this is a commercial orchard actually. So the grower pruned, pruned the, the, the dead branches. The, 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 so apparently the trees, uh, were healthy because the grower was cut and pruned the bad parts. So, I, well, this is, this was revealed by, by, by the results because actually in the NDVI that we get, the, we found that most of the trees were actually uh, infected. In, in different degrees of infection, but infected. So we couldn't find a good correlation between uh, You are muted. Dr. Jesse, you are muted. Okay, it's fine now. Yes, it is. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, I, I was telling that uh, it was funny because um, our results revealed that most of the trees were infected, but apparently they are healthy. So uh, this was in accordance with the QPCR. So uh, at the end, we are looking or we are discovering something that was invisible to the human eye because uh, well, uh, the grower thought actually that the the the, the the orchard was, was good when actually it was not. Uh, two years later of these images, uh, unfortunately, uh, this, this crop was almost completely dead and we couldn't continue the, the surveys in this crop because it was dead. So our findings uh, corresponding with the, with the two actually. Apart from images, we collect also some well, data uh, with the uh, leader as you see here, we get the 3D structure of the of the of every tree, and we use this information from one year to another to see the evolution of the of the tree. We represent this in in a Google Earth um, engine map. So by click by by clicking in in every tree, we could get the information. Here I have a video. Of the robot.
Now, to end my presentation, I'm going to talk about some uh, remote sensing using drones. Uh, well, the drones and uh, armed aerial vehicles that can cover larger areas than robots. And they can show data, uh, data superimposed on satellite images like this one. For instance, uh, this image is collected from a commercial platform where uh, the, the growers can access to see their, uh, well, nitrogen content, uh, water content, vegetative content, and all the information has been, uh, well, um, get uh, from the images of the drone. So drones used normally, uh, these kind of cameras, are cameras, are multispectral cameras with five wavelengths, and these five wavelengths correspond to the, the ones that are most used on the vegetative indexes, like blue, green, red, the red edge, uh, and the uh, near infrared, about 800. These cameras are quite uh, light, uh, is, they are not very expensive, so uh, they are actually very useful uh, to get this kind of images. These kind of images are collected with this camera. This is the blue, uh, in, the, in the top left is blue, in the top right is red, in the bottom left is green, and uh, two near the red edge is in, in the center, in the middle, and in the top right is uh, near infrared. So by doing some arithmetics uh, with these images, we can uh, get images of the vegetative indexes. In this, sorry, in this case, uh, by doing these uh, arithmetics, uh, we can calculate the chicory index and the OCAV index. Uh, the nitrogen concentration that is normally or in the literature calculated with this ratio, ratio uh, TK uh, against OCV, and we obtain this kind of image. Here, the blue dots uh, means that uh, the, good, the concentration of nitrogen is good, while the red dots, red pixels, uh, means that the nitrogen concentration is uh, under the average, is quite low. This is a orchard of citrus, and uh, the big one, and the, the narrow one is an orchard of, of avocado that is recently planted. So it's normal that everything is in red because they are very young plants. Also, the bigger is can be calculated with uh, near infrared and the red is the NDVI, and we see how the bigger is uh, is better. Uh, in, in this part of, of the image. However, there's some parts that may, may be in this part, in the, in the upper left part of the citrus orchard, there are some problems with the, the irrigation or the fertilization because this tree seems not to be in a very good state. Also, we can see the water status and we see how the, here the, the in, in yellow, or uh, is uh, the parts that are poor, poor irrigated, and these well um, are in accordance with the with with the problems with the bigger. So maybe there is some problems with the irrigation in the yellow area. So we can well use these images along the time. For instance, uh, this is uh, th this image. Upper, uh, upper right is uh, taken in April, after that in July, after in September. So uh, we can see how the bigger evolves along the time uh, between red is uh, uh, very low vigor and uh, blue is means high uh, vigor, good vigor. So we can see the evolution of our trees. And if you see those that are not evolving, for instance, this in the middle, in, in dark red, uh, well, they correspond to a very young plantation or uh, just soy. However, uh, other crops well, has good evolution. So maybe uh, the grower this way can compare irrigation system or can follow the evolution or the status of the crop. And finally, it's uh, good to say that, uh, well, to, deal, to get these maps, we uh, collect samples on the trees to get the nitrogen concentration using the reference analysis. This is a, um, 
an agree agreement uh, for elemental analysis of the leaves, of the leaves so we can get the nitrogen and other nutrients concentration. Well, as a conclusion, uh, I can say that uh, precision agriculture is a strategy that allows saving resources and optimizing processes by discovering spatial and temporal variability in the crops. Uh -huh. Also, that remote or proximal sensing are good tools to collect uh, agricultural data. They are based mostly on, on images, but we have to use correctly our platform, satellite, drone robot, depending on our application. These spectral imaging systems are sensors used to time uh, the electromagnetic radiation reflected or emitted from the crop. That, as I uh, saw at the beginning of the presentation, this can be affected by different status of the plant, by stress, diseases, etc. But uh, the spectral data must be contrasted with field data. The ground truth is very, very important. And uh, at the end, the data uh, needs to be converted into information because the sensors can collect most or many data, a lot of data, but maybe the grower uh, well, needs only small part of the data. So uh, um, part of our work is to convert this uh, data into good information. So um, one conclusion is that technology is promising, but this is not a conclusion. I mean, we have to, to continue working uh, because uh, to stay just wa uh, watching how images do our work or the grower maybe today is science, science fiction. It's, 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 not, uh, it's not the real. Well, I want to take the opportunity to present the conference Rutic 22 here in Valencia is this summer. Uh, any work uh, related with uh, fruit production uh, distribution, commercialization, inspection in the field or in post harvest is welcome. We are now the ASTAP uh, submission open. And just again, say thank you uh, to, to RIM, to the organizer, for inviting me uh, well, to share uh, with you this, this or my knowledge. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Uh, well, now I will answer any question that you you have. To Thank you so much, Dr. Jose, for for sharing this great information. It's really inspiring to see that how technology can help the industry. It's really great. We don't have so much time for question. Maybe one or two questions. Just if you have question, please just unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, I have to to sorry because I have um, some difficulties in some part of the presentation. But, no, it was uh, great. Sorry about that. That's okay. No worries. Uh, yes, uh, Ahmed, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, Jose, and thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, always uh, good to hear from you. Um, I'm happy that you touched on the point of, uh, of getting good images to do work uh, in this era of uh, big data. Uh, you see more and more tendency like let's collect any kind of data and the big data is going to solve the problem kind yeah. of thing as you showed in the last slide. Um, my question is when you are getting images at night and you are using artificial light, even if you're using artificial light during the day, uh, what criteria you use to make sure that the light actually gives you what you need for your camera. I usually struggle with the high spectral cameras because they are really narrow bands and, and you always don't trust that the problem was and the light itself didn't give you the correct frequency or there was another thing. So uh, my question is specific about this point. Okay, and, uh, well, um, about the frequency of the light, uh, we don't, we didn't have problems. We use LEDs, so LEDs are continuous lighting. It's, it's not uh, like uh, fluorescent tubes that has some frequency. So we, uh, we, we didn't have any, any problem with, um, with the lights. And we used to collect color camera, color color images with a, with a color camera, so it's it's like a flash. Yeah, but so, my question is about if you are doing this in the hyperspectral spectrum that is in the near infrared, then uh -huh. are, are LEDs mature enough to give us like no, reliable data no, there? No, definitely no, no, no. LEDs, uh, well. Uh, I, I don't think LEDs are good to, to get hyperspectral imaging because actually the um, the spectrum the emission spectrum of, of the lights is 
is um, is very selective. I mean, um, normally we use for hyperspectral imaging. Um, Um, ah, um, I have used halogen lamps. I don't know if this is what you use or something. Halogen lamps. Uh, yeah. uh, halogen lamps. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, the problem I that they are very much uh, energy lamps. consuming yeah, but, uh, yeah, lights. Yeah, yeah. We, we use halogen lamps, but as you said, uh, we, we have a robot using halogen lamps to do a hyperspectral imaging. And we need a petrol gener generator to for, um, to get the, to switch on the lights. With with LIDs, uh, at the moment we have tried with a com different combination of LEDs, but uh, for us has been almost impossible uh, to get hyperspectral images because. Uh, as I said, they are, they are very selective. They emit in particular wavelengths, so it's not possible. However, this could be also an advantage. Why I'm saying that? Because uh, we also have developed a, a, a illumination system based on LEDs that's uh, using a, a, a color camera that we have removed the near infrared filter. Uh, this LI, I, it's, it's a system that is composed by 20 different LIDs in different in 20 frequencies, and we illuminate uh, them in 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 a row. One every two milliseconds we get one image. Every two millis two or five milliseconds, illuminating with one of the 20 LIDs. So using a standard system, we get a multispectral system actually. Mm -hmm. Because we illuminate it with 400 and take one image, 420 uh, get one image. So uh, taking the advantage of the monochromatic uh, property of the LIDs, we develop uh, uh, illumination systems to collect multispectral images with a standard camera, let's say. Mm -hmm. so, and, and it was quite convenient. But we cannot use uh, LIDs for hyperspectral imaging. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, Gather. Gather. Uh, uh, I'm I'm yes. Okay. You are muted. Yeah. We do have time probably just to take the last question. Kenneth, please just go ahead and ask your question. Okay, thank you. Um, and that was a very wonderful presentation. Um, but just a quick one, just some general thoughts on the computation of vegetative indices. I realized in the previous slides that you showed um, with the trees with NDVI calculations and some other um, um, vegetative indices. What would be your general thoughts on um, the, the use of NDVI? Will there be a specific vegetative index that you would read over others? Um, with respect to disease detection on the field? Well, my opinion on NDVI is, is quite bad, actually. Uh, I mean, in, NDVI is, is used for everything. Um, many, many people use NDVI for almost detecting anything. Okay, NDVI is, is what is it? It's, it's just see some differences. You can approach these differences to your problem. I mean, if, if you want to detect uh, nitrogen concentration and using NDVI, you get some variability. Okay, you can see, okay, I'm discovering nitrogen concentration using NDVI. The same with water, with vigor, with whatever. But actually, for to me, NDVI is quite useless. Sure. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm sure to be, to be honest, <laughs> yeah. I have used uh, NDVI, but to be honest, for me, it's quite useless. Yeah, because I think I find similar trends um, 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 with my research as well, uh, because it looks as if the NDVI has been overrated. But in terms of doing some correlation and regression analysis, you really don't find the same results. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. In any case, if, if you have no more questions, sorry, if you have no more time for questions, I can answer by email, for instance, 
any questions that you can yeah i was i was going to tell that in case if anyone has more questions just uh just uh please just uh, contact dr jose and uh looks like he will be answering your question again uh dr jose uh on behalf of the dalhousie university thank you so much for your time and for the great uh, knowledge and information that you shared with us today and so it's a great pleasure and thanks again everyone for joining today's meeting and i'm i apologize for taking a little bit more of the, what we supposed to take your time and have a wonderful day thanks again dr jose okay thanks thank so much to you for inviting me to the talk and i was thank to all the people is attending my my presentation thank you thank you sure. take care everyone. thank you rim bye bye <laughs> Say thank you. Thank you. Bye.